My name is Samantha Dean, and for my final presentation, I chose to look at sexual assault and harassment at higher education institutions and their relation to the law. Over 40 years ago, we began to see the research on sexual violence on higher education institution campuses appear in the public media. Largely, this awareness came from the activities of the second wave feminist movement. This movement showcased the voices and perspectives of largely white, well-educated women who shared their experiences of sexual harassment, rape, and interpersonal violence. What was found was that these women's experiences were not unique, but actually widespread and persistent. One of the largest struggles we saw in the sexual assault movement was the recognition of intersectionality, which is the ways in which privilege and oppression relate to race, gender, class, sexual orientation, and age and shapes one's experiences. In the early 1970s, as the movement began to spread, we began to see rape crisis hotlines and centers appear in the metropolitan areas of California and Washington, D.C. On June 23, 1972, Title IX became a public law which prohibited discrimination based on sex and was signed by President Nixon. In 1975, Susan Brown Miller's text Against Our Will, Men, Women, and Rape helped to provide an overview of the history, politics, psychology, and anthropology of rape. This text helped provide the public with an understanding of rape as an act of violence, intimidation, and power. In 1978, the public began to see a rise in anti-rape activism, and we saw the first Take Back the Night march in San Francisco. Take Back the Night is an event we still see on many higher education campuses today. This event brings awareness to violence against women. In the late 1970s, an anti -rape as anti-rape activism spread, we began to see some higher education institutions establish services that supported survivors. While often these services were partnered with the community-based supports of rape crisis centers and campus women's centers, we also saw some university-based supports offer services to not just the campus, but to the community at large. By the early 90s, campus-based rape crisis centers were being established at many universities. Early research about sexual assault and harassment on college and university campuses found a number of key issues. The first issue was that there was no common language among college and university campuses to describe sexual assault and harassment, and that the language that was being used was troubling. For example, a study done by Kirkpatrick and Cannon examined women's rights of male erotic aggressiveness in dating courtship relationships. Second, sexual assault and harassment incidents were generally reported as involving force and aggressiveness in attempts at sexual intercourse that often included threatening the victim and inflicting physical pain upon them. Additionally, it was found that often victims of sexual assault were unlikely to report the incident to authority figures, including police, and often the victims of sexual assault and harassment knew their perpetrator. As anti-rape activism grew, so did the lobbying of the government for changes in policies. Part of this lobbying resulted in the Clary Act. This act originated with the lobbying efforts of Connie and Howard Clary, whose daughter Jean was mur murdered in her residence hall at Lehigh University in 1986 during her freshman year. Due to this tragedy, the Clary's founded Security on Campus Incorporated, which lobbied for government change and brought awareness to campus crime. In 1990, the first bill due to their lobbying was introduced, called the Student Right to Know and Campus Security Act. This act required universities to record campus crime statistics and safety policies. Not only did institutions have to record these findings, they also had to disclose their reports to current and prospective students, as well as employees at their institution. In 1992, Senator James Buckley sponsored an amendment to the act that provided guidance that these records kept by institutions and law enforcement were not considered confidential education records under FERPA. In 1998, the Student Right to Know and Campus Security Act was renamed to honor Connie and Howard's daughter. The act was now to be called the Jean Clary Disclosure of Campus Security Policy and Campus Crime Statistics Act, the Clary Act for short. In addition to a name change, this change also mandated daily security crime logs and expanded reporting requirements to include statistics for some off-campus areas. In 2000, the Campus Sex Crimes Prevention Act was added as an amendment to the Clary Act. 
this amendment required law campus law enforcement to include a statement in their annual reports advising institution communities where information concerning sex offenders could be found. The Clery Act was again widened in 2008 with the addition of the Higher Education Opportunity Act. This act expanded emergency response provisions by creating broader categories for hate crime reporting. In 2013, a new law, the Violence Against Women Act Amendments, amended the Clery Act to add additional reportable crimes. As anti-rape activism grew, legislation followed suit. One of the first forms of legislation that we saw was Title IX of the Education Amendment of 1972. This federal law prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex in education programs and activities. All public and private elementary and secondary schools in their districts, as well as colleges and universities that receive federal funding, must comply with Title IX. Under Title IX, discrimination on the basis of sex includes sexual assault and harassment. Under Title IX, there are a number of responsibilities and procedures that institutions receiving federal funding must comply with. First, institutions have the responsibility to respond promptly and effectively to any known sexual harassment or sexual violence. The institution must take immediate steps to eliminate any acts that create a hostile environment and prevent its reoccurrence while also addressing its effects. Second, whether a victim or their parents wish to file a complaint or do not request action is taken, the institution is still responsible to promptly investigate any known sexual harassment or sexual violence incidents and take the appropriate steps needed. Additionally, a criminal investigation of the acts of sexual harassment and violence does not relieve the institution of their own responsibilities to a prompt and equitable investigation of the incident. Along with the responsibilities that institutions have under Title IX, there are also mandated procedures that must be in place at institutions receiving federal funding. First, every institution must have and distribute a policy against sex discrimination. This policy must be widely distributed and available to all. Second, each institution must have a Title IX coordinator. In the policy against sexual discrimination, it must state that all inquiries of Title IX should go to this Title IX coordinator. Each institution must designate at least one employee to serve in this role, and that employee is responsible for the institution's compliance of Title IX. In addition to appointing this employee, all students and employees should be made aware of this individual's name and contact information. Finally, all institutions must have a known procedure for students to file any complaints of sex discrimination. Institutions must have grievance procedures for students to file complaints, including those of sexual harassment and violence. While institutions may use general disciplinary procedures to address these, fi these filed complaints, all procedures must be prompt and equitable. As part of these procedures, every complainant has the right to present their case. This includes the right to an adequate, reliable, and impartial investigation, the equal right to present witnesses and evidence, and the right to the same appeal process regardless of side. Additionally, every complainant has the right to be notified of the time frame that the institution will conduct a full investigation, when the parties will be notified of the final outcome, and when the parties may file an appeal. While federal law does limit disclosure of some information, the complainant has the right to the information about the sanction imposed on the perpetrator if that sanction directly relates to them. The grievance procedures put in place by an institution may include voluntary and formal methods, but the complainant must be notified of their right to the end of the informal process and the beginning of the formal complaint process at any time. In 2011, under the Obama administration, Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights, Rushlin Ali, issued a Dear Colleagues letter. This letter defined what sexual harassment and violence was, outlined the guidelines given to institutions by Title IX, and provided steps institutions could take to prevent sexual harassment and violence on their campuses. The Dear Colleague letter clearly defines sexual harassment and violence as physical sexual acts perpetrated against a person's will, or where a person is incapable of giving consent due to the victim's use of drugs or alcohol. An individual may also be unable to give consent due to an intellectual disability or other disabilities. Additionally, the document addresses the number of different categories that sexual violence can fall into, including rape, sexual assault, sexual battery, and sexual coercion. Second, the document outlines the guidelines of Title IX given to institutions. 
These include having a distributed policy against sex discrimination, having an assigned Title IX coordinator, and having grievance policies in place. Finally, the document outlines steps that institutions can take to prevent sexual harassment and violence on their campuses. One recommendation that is made is that all schools implement preventative education programs and make victim resources available. It is suggested that institutions include this programming as part of their orientation programs, trainings, and school-wide functions such as assemblies and back-to-school nights. While the implementation of these programs is key, it is also important to note what the Office of Civil Rights believes this programming should be centered around, and this includes what, what constitutes sexual harassment and violence, the policies and disciplinary procedures, and the consequences of violating any of the set policies. The Office of Civil Rights also recommends that specific material should be created that outlines these same topics and should be distributed and should serve as a resource for all individuals at an institution. Additionally, the document discusses that institutions are responsible for ensuring that their institutions do not create a hostile environment, that they prevent the occurrence of events, and address the effects that these events may have on an individual. In all cases, the institution should minimize the burden on the complainant in ensuring these things. Institutions should not only make the complainant aware of guidelines and rights that they have under Title IX, but the institution should also be aware that sexual harassment and violent violence events may also be followed by retaliation by the perpetrator or those associated with the perpetrator. All institutions should take steps to protect against any type of retaliation that may come upon the, upon the complainant. When responding the, to sexual harassment and violence events, some remedies that institutions may consider could be providing an escort for the complainant to safely move around the institution, provide counseling service and or medical services, and provide academic support, among a large variety of other options. In 2016, another Dear Colleagues letter regarding Title IX was issued. This letter summarized an institution's obligation regarding transgender students under Title IX and how the Department of Education and the Department of Justice would evaluate institutions' compliance with these obligations. While the letter did not add any additional requirements under Title IX for institutions, the document did offer guidance on how to apply the law. As stated in the information about Title IX, in order to receive funding from the federal government, a school must agree to not discriminate based on sex of any person. In the case of transgender students, a student's gender identity, an individual's internal sense of gender, should be treated as a student's sex for the purpose of Title IX. That being said, Title IX requires that when a student or the student's guardian notifies the school of the student's asserted gender identity that may be different than what was previously on record, the school should treat the student as they would any other student of that gender. Additionally, under Title IX, students should not be required to provide documentation of their gender identity. Just as with cisgender individuals, Title IX makes schools responsible for, for providing a safe, non-hostile, non-discriminatory learning environment for transgender students. Additionally, the document outlines that Title IX institutions should treat, should treat students consistently with their gender identity, even if the school records indicate differently. For example, if a student is, is assigned the sex of male at birth and their name assigned at birth is Mark, but the student identifies as female with the name Nicole, the institution should treat that student as any other female student and should consistently use the chosen female name and pronouns. In regards to this, it is outlined in the document that while Title IX does permit a school to provide sex segregated activities and facilities, the law also requires that transgender students must be allowed to participate consistently with their identity. For example, Title IX does allow institutions to have sex segregated bathrooms at their institution, but under the law, a transgender student should not be required to use a bathroom not consistent with their gender identity. They should also not be required to use an individual use bathroom if other students are not required to. An institution may have an individual use bathroom that is available to all as an option for transgender students. Additionally, another item outlined in the document is the area of privacy and education in terms of records kept by institutions. Under Title IX, an institution may not limit a student's educational rights or opportunities by failing to protect the student's privacy related to their transgender status. 
The, this privacy ensures that a student is protected and ensures personal consistency with gender identification in terms of using the appropriate names and pronouns. In 2017, the Department of Justice and Department of Education issued a Dear Colleagues letter that withdrew their statements and guidance on Title IX and their interpretation of the law regarding transgender students. After an incident of sexual violence or harassment happens at an institution, many things transpire for both the complainant and the alleged perpetrator. Under Title IX, the complainant receives a large number of supports, including but not limited to academic, emotional, and physical supports. Additionally, they may choose on their own accord to transfer to a different university or department, regardless of the steps taken by the university to protect them from any hostile environment on campus or the reoccurrence of any similar events. Additionally, the complainant could also choose to change career paths or simply drop out of the institution and not return to higher education at all. In terms of lifelong implications, the complainant could face a lifetime of struggles associated with the events that occurred. Under Title IX, the alleged perpetrator is also offered a number of rights. The main right that Title IX presents for the alleged perpetrator is their right to due process. The alleged perpetrator is given the right of presenting their own evidence and findings in sexual harassment and violence cases that occur. Additionally, they are entitled to the knowledge of the timeline of when decisions will be made. Beyond their rights guaranteed by Title IX, alleged perpetrators may make other decisions or suffer other implications based on the events that occurred. If required to transfer to a different higher education institution, other institutions may deny the student admission based on the events that occurred, making it difficult for them to find an institution to continue their education at. Additionally, the alleged perpetrator may be required to register as a sex offender, creating a lifetime of consequences that they will need to endure. So the question that comes to mind is what are universities doing to prevent sexual assault and violence on their campuses, as well as how are they complying with Title IX? After their annual Title IX report for 2016 through 2017, Harvard University reported that they were able to decrease their resolution time from 4.4 months to 3.8 months. Additionally, they reported seeing a 50% increase in disclosure of incidents to Title IX coordinators from 2014 to 2017. They largely attributed this to fully staffing their Office of Dispute Resolution. The university staffs seven staff members directly in the Title IX office and has 55 Title IX coordinators among their academic departments on campus. Tulane University in New Orleans, Louisiana has also made strides to lower the number of sexual harassment and assault incidents on their campuses and to comply with Title IX. The institution conducted a study in 2017 using the Administrator Researcher Campus Climate Collaborative Survey, which bases its questions on perpetrator behavior. They found that when asked, were you sexually assaulted, a lot of people were unable to identify that they had been, so they needed to ask behavior-based questions to get a more accurate measure of sexual assault at their institution. They found that 41% of the undergraduate women that responded answered that they had experienced sexual assault since they had been enrolled at the institution. Due to this survey, the institution has hired an assistant director of fraternity life who specializes in men's education and a health promotion specialist to educate graduate and professional students on sexual assault. Additionally, they plan to start a men's mentoring program at their institution to promote positive male behavior on campus. Iowa State University has brought in an associate director in their Office of Equal Opportunity and a specialist in compliance with the American with Disability Act to help with Title IX investigations. Having a specialist that can handle disability-related complaints has allowed other investigators more time to handle Title IX compliance. Additionally, students at the University of Denver have called for more action by their administration by using Instagram. On January 12th, an anonymous account surfaced that detailed the experiences of more than 50 students of the University of Denver who had experienced sexual harassment and violence on campus. These stories range from having experiences of being drugged at parties to raped at fraternity houses, but all shared the feeling of disappointment by the institution's response to these types of incidents. The account quickly gained followers and had demands for the institution that included DU's campus safety receiving trauma-informed training, as well as hiring more officers of color and of officers that had worked with survivors of trauma. Additionally, they demanded more lighting on campus, the fixing of the campus blue light system, and the removal of those guilty of gender-based violence offenses from campus. The institution responded 
stating that they would not reduce the funding associated with gender-based violence prevention and education. Additionally, they committed to upgrading training and to punish those guilty of gender-based violence offenses in alignment with the university's code of conduct. While there has been a large amount of progress in the area of sexual harassment and violence at higher education institutions, there is still work to be done to ensure that all individuals have access to an education without fear of experiencing sexual harassment or violence.